I don't seem to have any video. Hmm. I can hear you just fine. Yeah, that's strange. Do you actually make it into the office today? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I thought about biking in. I got the snow tires on now, but but if I work from home, I actually get to like code. I know. <laughs> I, I took the tea in, actually. I, I did cheat. <sighs> All the West Coast people are like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I wish it was snowing more here. <laughs> Been pretty pretty dry in the northwest. I can enjoy it vicariously. <laughs> wow. wow. <laughs> yeah. Pretty pretty jealous. Wow. There's nothing better than snow. Says you. I would be so much happier weather wise on the west coast. And yet. Yeah, if you don't like cold, you're living in the wrong place. Yeah, I'll tell that to my entire friends and family because I can't convince them all to up and move with me. <laughs> all right. Let's... Um, I don't think we have anything on the agenda. I added in talking about uh, the L7 can change hear policy. You, Alyssa. Oh. Uh, we'd also we brought up my fault. over Slack um, tweaking the governance rules to say that changes to the data plane should be runtime guarded but we never actually got consensus on that. Does anyone object? Because if not, I'll send out a PR and just ping maintainers. Uh, I, I think my only question would be like, what, I mean, what qualifies as a change, right? I mean. I would, I would say things that are seen upstream or downstream, right? I don't think you're changing the way that headers work. If you're changing like timing characteristics, no. You know, access logging, no. Yeah, okay, but yeah, no, yeah, that makes sense. Actual I think wire any, on the wire change. Yeah. yeah. Cool. I'll send that out. Um, yeah. And then again, just to, just to call it out because uh, we mentioned this in a series of PRs, which probably not everyone read, but the last time we cut the release, we were doing the flag flips and realized that it's really not a great policy to have like all of the L7 changes land in one PR. So we're going to change the way that the runtime cards work. And as people submit PRs, they will be applied by default unless they're really high risk. So things like changing the buffer implementation or changing the HTTP 1.1 codec will obviously be off by default so we can get fuzzing and everything done. Things that we think are innocuous uh, will be on by default. Mm -hmm. But again, if they cause you problems, you can just track release notes and look for things to flip back false. Um, so hopefully that doesn't cause problems for folks. And if so, again, we can discuss this. But the alternative is, is a lot of busy work doing them one at a time, which is, which is kind of painful, or mm -hmm. having like the big, massive, awful change, which we think is suboptimal. Yep. <clears throat> makes, makes sense. I mean, can't, can't, isn't one of the alternatives just a, a bot which, you know, flips the flags uh, on a predetermined schedule? Yeah, but I don't, I don't know how that's better, like, doing it, you know, essentially, like, people can write their own scripts to have them false by default and do them on their own schedule, like. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm just saying it's in terms of uh, covering all the alternatives, I feel like that. Oh, is that's fair. Yeah, we could. If someone wants to do resourcing for that, like if it causes some problems, I would love someone to write a bot to do that because I think that would be I, fun. I think, I mean, I think your plan of doing it on by default, unless we decide that it should be off, I, I, I think that will reduce most of the pain and it's pretty, pretty easy to handle. Yeah. Um, so that, that, that would be my vote, but as you say, if someone wants to work on some type of alternative from a bot, that's- And again, I would say for like big companies that, that care about stable stuff, they can, again, and their import scripts or so they can just watch that file and they can literally have yeah. a script that says for every flag in the object that tracks all the flags, you know, set them false in my config file. Like it's very scriptable right. uh, to, if you want to have them false by default for like Google or something, we yeah. can pick that as part of the import process. Yeah. Uh, but I think, Again, unless someone's got a pony up resources for a bot, I think this is the, the way to keep the kind of binary changes least painful for the most people. Yeah, and I mean, and, and just based on previous history, I'm, I'm thinking through, and I mean, there's very few changes in which I would say should be off by default. Like I can think of the buffer change, I can think of obviously the new HTTP parser, but so like- far. Personally, most, most our deployment of, strategy internal is off by default, get the binary roll down and then flip them on separately. Yeah, but again, sure. we can just do that. Like yeah. we can we can script that programmatically internally. But I think for most people, like 
having a, you know, what just happened here and having to track PRs of, oh, someone flipped a flag. And we're like, where, where was this flag? What does this do? And then have to find a different PR. Yeah. I think it's more trouble than it's worth. I think that, I think that makes sense. Yeah. So I've got one PR in flight and two more uh, in, uh, actually two in flight and one more ready to go once those two land to switch our tooling over and everything else. Yeah. And I just put a comment on that PR or on one of the PRs is that it's worth syncing with Harvey just because he's done so much work now around proto tooling. And now there's frameworks for like in Python for parsing the proto tree and stuff like that. It's possible that when you looked at this a couple of months ago and thought about making a script to actually look at the protos. I think you're talking about the theta by default, which is yeah. different. Oh, different. I'm talking about the runtime guards and there um, are two things. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It, it would, I mean, just thinking forward though, it would be, I mean, I think we're also planning on getting some type of Clang tooling into the code base. And it would be nice if there is a way either through Clang tooling attributes, something like if this was fully programmatic, meaning, you know, if we, I, I'm just thinking through that if there is a way to tag a particular runtime call in the source code, um, you know, that then everything could just happen automatically and we don't need these Python scripts like that would be. Well, really so the, for the flag flipping one, it'll go away. The only one that sticks around is the filing bugs to remove code. Right. Uh, I have one of my PRs was to just remove all the flag flip tooling because we don't need it anymore. So okay. programmatically, um, when you add a flag, it'll check unless you add it to the off by default or on by default. Documentation says add it to on by default unless it's a major change. And then I just added a line to governance in the PR that's not out yet saying, hey, check to see if there's any off by default. So again, like I think like once or twice a year we'll have an off by default, like Derek's put in one. But uh, if it's yeah. if if the new default is on by default, can we just switch the thing in the code so that we don't have to do anything unless it's off by default? I like having them listed just because then you oh, have a programmatic yeah. check. Yeah. Okay, but, all right, sure. I mean, it's adding a, a line to a file. And then and then the nice thing about that is that later on we can add validation of like, are you referencing flags that don't exist? Or are you setting are you setting false a flag that no longer exists? I think sure. is a big one. Because like if you're turning it off manually and it goes away, you should be able to be warned about that. Sure, okay, you need to it. sounds good. There's method to my madness. No, sounds um, good, yep. Does anyone else have agenda items? I don't have any. Um, do you do you want to give an update on V3, Harvey, in terms of where, where we're at? Sure. Um, so we resumed basically after KubeCon the work on V3. Uh, Derek, Lizanne, and myself are currently working on it. We're actually looking for more volunteers if anyone's interested. So please reach out to me on Slack um, or, or elsewhere if, if you are interested in working on that. Um, right now we have, um, let's see, we have the V3 Alpha, uh, API is being generated directly from V2 programmatically. We have a bunch of plumbing to be able to do things like ingest V2 configurations and automatically translate them to V3 Alpha inside of Envoy. I'm currently working on this set client tooling, which uh, Matt mentioned before, which will um, allow us to basically take all these V2 references in uh, Envoy and turn them overnight into V3 Alpha references. This is just going to be done in like in a single PR, massive PR, changing like the entire world. And uh, that one's uh, basically what's going to be my focus in the next uh, week or so. And um, I know other folks are working on things like adding in, uh, these ones are going to add in some annotations for rename, to allow you to specify fields in V2 that you want to be renamed in V3. Um, and uh, I think Derek's going to be working on some documentation stuff mm -hmm. there. Hey, sorry. So the plan is to move away from proto comments to proto annotations. Um, for things which are related to the versioning story, yes. For like you know, we want to rename to this. It'll be an annotation on a field. That that to me seems to make the most sense. Yeah, me too. I mean, I, I guess what I'm asking is, it seems cleaner to just have everything be annotations. Versus. Well, I mean, some of these things are like lengthy comments, like, you know, in next major version, insert a blurb or that kind of thing. So I these see. Okay. Uh, made sense to actually include in the common text. Uh, but yeah, so some of the others, like, you know, not implemented yet or that kind of thing, I feel might be better served as, as a proto annotation. And as we add these uh, proto annotations, it'll be a pretty trivial PR to. Uh, add that as a secondary source of that information and deprecate the old one. So 
anyone who's interested in that kind of hygiene I highly recommend doing that. Yeah. Hold, hold back until V3 ships next year before doing the sort of optional things like this. So we will be best off focusing our efforts on V3 stuff uh, for the next few weeks, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. I don't. I don't have anything else. Did anyone else on the call want to discuss anything? Uh, mind if hi. I chime in? Um, yeah. Hi. This is Ram. Hello. Uh, I just uh, joined. I, I was. Uh, you know, I'm working on this per connection object and uh, uh, the socket exposing socket options. I was just wondering if. Uh, Anybody had some views that uh, I could use during implementation, or the certain questions that I have. If uh, you know, people are uh, people are aware about the topic, I can uh, ask. I think we've pretty well covered it in the in the comments in the issue. Um, yeah. Our... Yeah. So, Matt, uh, thanks, thanks so much. But a couple of questions inside uh, my org, they've asked. You know, I understand, uh, I think the uh, comments were quite descriptive, but uh, what about, uh, you know, I, I had an, a question about uh, the non con network connection, which is already available. So we are not worried about that, right? Because uh, through other uh, through other callbacks, you can actually access the net, non con network. So the question no, you was can't. That you 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 cannot access the non cons network connection from an L7 filter. You can access it from an L4 filter. Yeah, but uh, but so the question that I got asked was uh, why do we why, what is the what is the Uber goal for this uh, per connection object? Because I have one interpretation. Like if I could hear it from your uh, uh, what exactly what is the Uber goal for uh, this per, per connection object? Because what to expose the socket options, we don't per se require this uh, per connection object. We can do it in multiple ways. Would it? Would it? Like, could you just uh, briefly explain what what are we trying to fully accomplish? I understand parts of it, like it it, it maintains state across different uh, filters on that connection. But we, beyond we, that, I, I I think we added the per connection object because you asked for it. Like you wanted to store state across filters for a particular. Uh, request, right? So my interpretation was that I wanted to change the connection state. Like I just wanted to set the uh, socket read and uh, receive buffers. But yes, through through the uh, L7, L7 abstractions, what we have, we can definitely uh, modify the state and maintain the state. But is there any other, uh, is there any other need or is there any other design that you have in mind that uh, that's not Yet, uh, because you said you needed a full uh, use case implemented, right? Yeah. So one of which is the socket options. Is there anything else that you have in mind that where we can leverage this kind of an infrastructure? I, I, I think there are probably a bunch of use cases in which it could be used, but I don't want to merge any code without an explicit use case. So if you don't actually need the per connection object, we should close that PR. Okay, okay. Um, so what we, whatever we've discussed is to access, use the per connection object through uh, for exposing the socket option. So that still remains, right? If, if we can get a use case like that. So I, I mean, the use case as I still understand it is that we're gonna add a mutable HTTP connection object and we're gonna expose that from the L7 filter interface with a limited set of connection operations. Uh, that, that makes sense to me. Okay, so if I just want to, uh, uh, that's fine. I think most of the questions are answered. I just was, uh, you know, this is my first time I'm joining the community call, so I, I thought I'll uh, get become more uh, familiar with the uh, process and share some ideas. Sure, sounds great. Okay, great, okay. thanks. And then, uh, Craig, do you want to? Yeah, sure. Uh, I was just a follow up uh, from one of the KubeCon talks, specifically uh, the Envoy on Fire debugging a service mesh one. Uh, the uh, access log service 
came up and there were some questions. It sounded like just like a call out to the community about a potential reusable access log server as an open source project. And I was just kind of wondering if there was any work within the community that you're aware of that's uh, working on something on that. Or if there is interest in that, would it be uh, like starting from the ground up? Um, there's nothing that I know of yet. So what, what we have in open source right now is we have a project called Go Control Plane, which, you know, it, it it's mostly targeted right now towards config serving. So caching XDS resources and sending them down. But one of the things that it does do is that it deals with getting all the protos compiled and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think it would be reasonable to take Go Control Plane and potentially build either a separate service or something optionally built into Go Control Plane that could allow it to be used for access log handling. Um, I think we have a general interest of making Go Control Plane more useful to avoid the case in which, you know, we have literally probably a hundred plus or more different control planes out there. Like everyone implements their own for a variety of different reasons. Um, that's not a situation that I would like to be in. I, I think it would be better if, you know, people had to implement less logic. So, you know, if there's interest, obviously, in figuring out how to do that um, from the open source perspective, I, I think we're very happy to support that effort, um, you know, but it's going to take some people to actually drive that. So okay. one thing I can say is that um, the Turbine Labs Rotor project, I mean, Turbine Labs doesn't exist anymore, but Rotor was open source and it's still available on GitHub. Um, and it actually has an ALS implementation on top of Go Control Plane built into it. Uh, that we use to collect logs when we were a going concern. So, yeah, it's open source. It's free to steal. Yeah, I, I mean, and and but like one one thing that we should think about is that if people either start using that code again or we want to maintain it again, we should just move that into the org and make oh, yeah. it, you know, and make it like a more official project and get maintainers and and you know that that type of thing. Yeah, it's very specific to what we were building, but there's some right. code in there that you might be able to at least look at as an right. example for yeah. adding it to say Go Control Plane. Right. I think I think that at a high level what I'd recommend for people that are listening is that like, we are very interested in having um, control plane implementations that are useful for the community, whether those be more building blocks or full featured servers or stuff like that. So if there's interest, you know, I'd recommend either opening issues in the main project or opening issues against go control plane and either tagging myself or others and we can, we can hopefully try to get those routed. Thanks. Uh, yeah, that's all I had. Uh, sorry if this wasn't the correct place to raise the question. No, no, no. This is this is definitely the right place, and it's something that I've personally been thinking about, and I know came up quite a bit at KubeCon. It's just becoming, it's becoming very clear that we have basically every organization. <laughs> developing their own control planes. Um, you know, we're in a very, very early stage of the uh, managed service mesh projects and lots of companies are not using them. You know, like tons of companies are building their own control planes. And it, it's, a, it's a tough problem because in a perfect world, obviously we would not do that but people are doing this for a reason, you know, because their situations are opinionated or they need various changes. And, and you know, it's like we're trying to balance having something useful from a project perspective um, versus trying to do something so general that no one will actually use it. And then they go off and do their own thing again. So, um, you know, th there's, there's just no easy answer. So I, I think that if there is interest um, in helping to, you know, bring some of this into the org, my personal feeling is that doing it as more robust libraries versus a, you know, like this is the thing that you will use is probably going to be more useful and tractable.
Cool. Anything else? Yeah. Uh, hi, guys. Um, I'm Yaroslav. I'm from Kong. Um, I have a question about WebAssembly support in Envoy. Uh, I remember that um, back at Envoy Core, in uh, Lijan estimated that it will take uh, a couple releases and more releases to bring this WebAssembly support upstream. So my question is actually to, to you guys, because there is already uh, yeah, like work implementation in this repository. Yeah, like what, what is your uh, yeah, like definition of being ready for upstream? Why will it take yeah, like this estimate yeah, like about six months to get it merged upstream? Is, is Lijan on the call? No. No. Um, so my, my understanding of this, which is not current, is that I, I think it's really probably comes down to the people that wrote the code work on Istio and they're busy and they know that to get it merged upstream, it's going to have to have a certain amount of test coverage, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I don't think there's any blocker there. So like, I think with extra resources, it could probably get merged upstream much faster. Um, if you or others out there are interested in helping with that, um, why don't you send me an email and I can make introductions with the people who are working on it. And it's possible that you could just help them with the upstreaming. Yeah, yeah that's, that's definitely our intention. Uh, and I think that the next question, yeah, like even uh, John itself, uh, he mentioned that the next step into bringing this uh, upstream it would be uh, just settling uh, binary interface yeah next uh, SDK and uh, going on from there but yeah the, the question is is it actually critical to settle on uh, binary interface before merging upstream or not? I think that I, I think that's something that we can discuss I I think as long as the filter is marked alpha I don't think it's critical that we that that we settle on the binary interface. Obviously, before we switch it from alpha to production, we we absolutely have to settle on the binary interface. But no, I don't I, I don't think it's required that the binary interface is finalized as long as it's clearly marked alpha. Okay, because we took initial look into the source code, and um, basically, we would love from our side we would like to see changes into everything into. Um, like binary interface into proto files exposed to proto interface exposed to actual users uh, because at the moment it's right now it's it's really focused uh, on east use case yep it's not really friendly to some right anything. i would uh, that's my concern is that i suspect that what they did is very istio focused and it's not going to be generally consumable so i would love very much if if you would get involved in that um and you could work with them to help get it upstreamed. But is it fine, for example, to uh, bring uh, this yeah, like implementation in, in its current state upstream and then declare it is uh, completely alpha, no backwards right. compatibility? Yeah. And right. Like, I don't, I don't have any problem with that. I think as long as it's clearly marked alpha, we can get it upstream and then we can, we can iterate. Um, it would be good if you could list out some of the concerns that you have with the interfaces that are implemented currently, um, just so you know that we can make sure that everyone's in agreement on how to actually get them fixed. Um, and then you could work with the SDO folks to start getting the code merged upstream faster. Okay, okay, thanks. That's, that's all yeah, fine. yeah. But yeah, it, I would say just sh shoot me an email and then I can, I can link together all of the various people. Thank you. I, I was wondering if there's any end users with opinions about the security policy update, given oh. that we have all been talking about it, but yeah, no end users. There's a, um, for those that are out there who are end users, there's a pull request that I opened in the last few days or week, I'm not sure, there's been so many holidays and breaks, uh, that will allow in very specific cases end users on the um, security pre-disclosure list. So if you have opinions on that, I would, I would take a look. Hopefully we'll get that merged today or tomorrow.
Anyone else? Um, so Matt, I just wanted to ask another question on uh, the StartPit implementation, which uh, you were, I raised an issue and you said, so is it, is it fine that we have another filter called uh, to just to do security and stuff like that? You said you asked me to look at the tap filter. I haven't looked at it yet, but are there any tools or should, how should the, should, should StartPit be just in a standalone uh, network operation or should there be any interest? Sorry, it's it's very hard to hear you. What what was that? Oh, uh, so I I was asking questions about the uh, tarpet issue. Yeah. That, uh, you had some. You asked me to look at the uh, tap filter, right? So yeah. I was wondering, like, so instead of having the entire infrastructure set up, like, should we have another filter called security filter for? Uh, so we use and um, we have our own variation of security filter, as I've mentioned. We call it the security filter. We do some uh, sort of filtering for all the traffic that uh, hits our uh, load balances. And I was wondering, like, would that be a use case for uh, Envoy, or do you guys not want to have that filter? Should no, we, uh, we, we definitely do want a filter that I would say would become a, a WAF type filter and do tar pitting and blocking and those types of things. My comment yeah, in that so PR is that we we don't want to re-implement matching. Like we have a big problem in the code base of every filter independently implementing matching. Um, so no, what so I would we we didn't re-implement. We just like borrowed. We just duplicated the code for uh, uh, the uh, RBAC matcher. So whatever the code is, we kind of uh, we didn't rewrite it. We kind of leveraged the same logic and. Uh, change some of these uh, keywords like you know how do you match based on what kind right of right so what i'm explain what i'm explaining to you is that we don't want to re-implement the matching so what we'll need to do is we'll need to use an existing matching construct probably the tap matchers because it's the most flexible um and then using that type of matching system we can then implement different types of actions whether those be tar pitting or blocking etc cetera, etc cetera. Yeah, we do like three, target, drop, and reset. We also do like a static page a redirect and capture is something that we're working on. So um, we, we have different, so if, with that, in, uh, you know, if you have that as the context, so for this particular target issue, would you think that we should raise another uh, uh, overarching issue and probably have that implemented or just have a target, standalone target implementation um, um, I, I, I think I would like to see a complete design doc uh, just to make sure that we're on the same page. Okay. Okay, thanks. I, I, I'll, uh, I'll follow up on the issues I have uh, any further questions or uh, I'll update with the design what we think or what I think and then we can collect feedback. Great. Thank you. Sounds great. All right, I think we're out of time. Bye, everyone. Yeah. All right, thanks. Bye. Bye.